welcome to Sakshi TV special immigration show with attorney Ms. Prashanti Reddy from the Law Offices of Prashanti Reddy PLLC. Please note that Sakshi TV now has three immigration shows every week. On Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. EST with attorney Ms. Prashanti Reddy in English. On Thursday at 5.30 p.m. EST with attorney Chand Parvatnini. And on Friday at 6 p.m. EST with attorney Bhanu Hidra. Please tune in to ask your questions. If you're an immigration attorney and would like to join our special shows, please email us at usatsakshi.com or call 866-725-7441. Before we begin the show, please note that the information provided on this show is not a legal advice and is for general information purposes only. Sakshi TV or its agents will not be responsible for use of information. If you need specific legal advice, please contact the attorney directly. Ms. Prashanti needs no introduction, but if you need consultation, Please log on to readyesq.com for contact information. And when you connect with them, don't forget to mention Sakshi TV. From the beginning, readyesq.com has put a wealth of free information and online tools in the hands of the immigrant community and for the benefit of you as employers. The readyesq.com site provides you with the latest and cutting edge information on U.S. immigration laws and policies explained in terms you don't have to be a lawyer to understand. Today's topic is H-1B alternatives and other FAQs. We will continue the knowledge session along with the news and updates on latest immigration followed by Q&A. Before we get into the topic, you can call us on the numbers displayed on the screen for questions related to immigration and also ask for tips. Hi, Ms. Teddy, how are you doing? Good, Tony. How are you? Very well, thank you. How was your uh, Christmas, the holidays and the New Year? It was good. It was good. I got a little sick afterwards, so I had to miss the show last week. But yeah. Right. Doing good. We missed you last week, Mr. Reddy. Glad, so did I. glad to see you well. Right. Yeah. So, um, Ms. Reddy, starting, uh, we're starting 2023 with uh, H1B alternatives. But before that, do we have any latest immigration updates that uh, something we're looking forward to in 2023? What's going to change or, you know, uh, what's to be expected? So, uh, what we're going to do, Tony, actually, is uh, today we're going to talk about H-1B registration because that's kind of uh, the key thing that, um, you know, is going to happen in the next, you know, in March. By now, you're an immigration expert as well, so you know what's going to happen when. So, H-1B cap season is coming, so we need to uh, educate our viewers on, uh, you know, to start off with how to do the H-1B registration and then you know, we'll do a series on H1's registration and then how to actually file cases. Um, and then once the cap season is over, then we can talk about H1B alternatives once people can no longer file H1s. Uh, but I thought that before we do the H1B registration, we'll actually um, talk about a few updates. Right. And then, and then you know, we'll uh, segue into immigration updates. And if we have time, We'll finish it. Otherwise, uh, you know, we can continue that next uh, next week. Of course, Mr. So to start off with uh, the immigration updates, I wanted to mention that USCIS, um, there's a proposal for USCIS to increase its fees, which is not good news because already uh, US, the, they charge quite a lot of fees, especially for H1s. Um, so... The first proposal is for all those people, um, employers who file H-1s, they want to increase the uh, fee uh, by $600. That's the first fee increase so that they can, so this is for uh, H-1B employers as well as I-140 uh, applicants, I-140 uh, employers as well. So people filing I-140 as well as H-1s, those petitioners, and they'll increase the fee by $600 across the top um, so that they can they can uh, make up the costs for administration of the asylum program. Right. So as I've mentioned before, um, H-1B employers are always the punching bags. So whenever something happens or whenever they need more money, um, they always come after the H-1B program and uh, always meddle with it. So this is what they're doing, increasing the fee by 600. Then the basic fee for a H-1B, if you don't include all the other fees, is $460. That basic fee also, they're increasing to 780 
So if you look at the fee increase, the basic fee increase plus the uh, increase over the top of that, it's coming to almost $1,000 uh, increase in the H-1B uh, fee. So uh, not very good news, but this is a proposal. It's something we have to remember. So they have published it in the federal register. They're waiting for comments. Once the comments period is over, which is in the first week of March, then they will decide on you know how to proceed depending on what comments they get, suggestions, et cetera. Uh, they've also increased the EB-5 uh, fee from 3,675 to 11,160. So that's triple, more than triple. They have incre increased, they haven't spared family-based uh, cases either. Uh, the family-based uh, green cards uh, increasing for fiancé visas from 535 to 720. And for other family-based cases, like, for example, if you want to sponsor your spouse or you want to sponsor your uh, parents, uh, any of those cases, siblings, any family-based case, they're increasing from 535 to 820. So almost, almost double. Right. And then... Uh, uh, last but not the least, the H-1B registration fee itself is $10, but the proposal now is in to increase it to $215. So that That's is 200% increase in the uh, H-1B fee, H-1B registration fee. So this is on top of that $1,000 that I talked about for the H-1B fee. Right. So That's the fee proposal. Let's see what happens. As I said, once the comments period gets over, I'm hoping that something in this will change. Maybe there will be more, uh, they will decrease some of the fee here, but let's see. The other um, update is the January visa bulletin. We're almost, I know we're almost, uh, the February visa bulletin is almost out, but not yet. As, as far as I, I didn't check today, but as of yesterday yeah. at least. Um, but with reference to January visa bulletin, not much of a change in the EB2 and EB3 categories. This is both good news and bad news. The good news is there's no retrogation, so that's a good news. Right. The bad news is that um, you know it has already retrogressed in January, um, in December, so um, not a very good outlook for the rest of the year. Um, we were hoping it will move forward slightly, maybe in January, but it hasn't. So let's see. But it's the also other, not retrogress, it's probably like in the middle, like it's probably just kind of hanging on. Yeah, let's hope. And let's hope it's, maybe... Is there uh, hope already? Maybe, maybe we'll come back next month. I'm, I'm hoping that it'll move forward at least a little by, you know, next right. month. Right. Uh, EB1 uh, for Indian nationals has been current for many years, but now it has retrogressed in January. So even EB1 people are out of luck. So retrogressed by a year. So people who filed in February 1, 2022 can file. That's the uh, final action date. And the dates for filing is retrogressed by six months, June 1, 2022. <clears throat> so that's also not good news, but it is what it is. And it was it is what is expected we, as the consulates have started processing their family-based cases more vigorously. Uh, they are using up the family-based numbers. So, you know, there's not much trickle down of family-based numbers to employment-based uh, as there was during COVID in the last few years. So uh, it's expected that there will be um, less number of uh, visa numbers available for employment-based. Uh, the other update that I wanted to talk about was um, USCIS, basically because they're taking so long to process all cases, and especially citizenship cases. Earlier, they used to process citizenship cases in six to eight weeks. Now they're taking uh, over a year, sometimes a year and a half, sometimes two years to process wow. citizenship cases. So in the meantime, um, you know, if you're on a green card and if your green card expires, under the old law, um, you have to apply for an I-90, which is an uh, application to extend your green card. So this was an additional fee and expense and uh, as well as time required to you know fill out another form and send it out um but what they did uh, previously was if you filed at least six months before the expiry of your green card they would give you a stamp in your passport which would be like an extension of the green card an added stamp but now they're saying not, none of those has to be done you don't have to go and get a stamp you don't have to file for an extension 
the receipt of the citizenship itself will act as an extension of your green card. So you can show that for your I-9 purposes, employment purposes, et cetera, as proof that you know you are a green card holder. Okay. So you don't have to go and apply for an extension. Uh, so that's you know good news, resulting from some bad news, which is you know they're taking so long to process citizenship cases. Okay. Uh, another update is um, uh, so. Uh, another update is, let's see, the public charge law. So we've talked about public charge law before. Basically, in order to get a green card, you have to prove that uh, you will not become a public charge once you become a permanent resident, meaning you will not take money from the government. Uh, you will not need to take money from the government. So this has undergone many changes, the public charge law. Uh, previously, um, it, it started off in, I think, 1999 when um, it was not clearly defined as to who would be a public charge and who wouldn't be, uh, but they were following certain guidelines and it, uh, you know, it was, it was going on. Uh, but under the Trump administration in, uh, in um, 29, 2019, Basically, they became very stringent of the public charge law. And when we had to find all, file all those applications in 2020, when the visa numbers become, became available, we had to file like 300 documents, 300 page applications with a lot of documentation showing the finances uh, of the applicant and their health insurance and uh, all other uh, finances that they had, like their shares, their you know money market account, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and this was very onerous and also it was not clearly defined as to who's a public charge and who isn't. So Biden and his administration has kind of overturned that law and they have clearly defined uh, who will be considered to be a public charge and who won't be. Um, so they basically said that any benefit not involving money in general won't be a public charge. So for example, they've given examples that if you take food stamps, uh, if you uh, your child takes the insurance under the CHIP, Ch Children's Health Insurance Program. If you take Medicaid, meaning you get free health care if you, know, you uh, uh, meet the poverty guidelines. Um, if you take a housing benefit, uh, like free housing for you know, poor people. Uh, if you take a COVID shot, because COVID shots are free, uh, but that, that won't be considered to be uh, you know, a benefit to you. Or if you get some kind of a disaster relief, like if you're in a hurricane, you're in a flood, in a wildfire, you know, FEMA offers disaster relief, that, all that, that kind of relief won't be covered under the public charge law. Uh, also, like children get free school lunches. If the children take that, that's not considered to be a public charge law, et cetera, et cetera. But what will be considered to be a public charge law a uh, public charge under the law is uh, if you take uh, money from or income maintenance money, meaning that your only source of income is the government and you're dependent on it, the money given by them to sustain yourself and your family. That's called SSI and uh, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TANR, and Supplemental Security Income, SSI. If you take that, if you've ever taken that in the past, then you'll be considered to be uh, likely to become a public charge uh, in the future, so you most probably won't get a green card. Long-term institutionalization at any government, at government expense, including when you're using Medicaid, so this is an exception. Generally, Medicaid is not covered under public charge law, but uh, if you're taking Medicaid uh, for the sake of being institutionalized for in a long-term basis, meaning you know, you're on a mental health institution or uh, you're get, getting some kind of a long-term physical therapy, you know, you are recovering some, from some kind of injury or medical problem that needs institutionalization. If you take that uh, and you take the government's help there, that will be considered to be a public charge law. And you'll yeah. come under the public charge law and probably you won't get a green card. Um, so that's something they have said. At least they have said what is and what isn't. Which so is that's good. a lot of... Updates must ready. I mean, uh, so rapidly a lot of things have kind of uh, accelerated change. 
Right. But uh, with that, I think we have to move to H one B registration. Process. Yes. So my next, uh, uh, the next thing we're talking about is H one B registration. And, uh, and, and um, how to register. Yeah, how to register. So basically, in order to register for a H one B, and I wanted to just give this information for people who want to register themselves, so that you know to empower them to be able to do this themselves if they want to, or even if they're doing it through an attorney to be able to. Uh, know what the process is so that the, when the attorney gives you some instructions, you don't mess up. Uh, because if you do, then in the last minute, uh, it will be a, a problem for you as well as your uh, attorney to register you. So first of all, you have to go open an account on the myuscis.gov. Right? You have to sign up for an account. You have to give an email address, create a password. Then they'll ask you for a two-step verification process. Uh, either you can use your email or you can use your text, SMS text. So every time you uh, log in, they'll send you a code, either by text or by email, and enter that code, and that's how you log in. Provide uh, a password, provide uh, your secret questions and answers. Uh, and then the first most important step after that, after you created an account, is you have to select I am a H1B registrant. You don't select I am a H1B petitioner, though that seems to be uh, a natural thing that you would select. But in, if you're registering a case, you don't select that. You select I am a H1B registrant. If you don't select that and then you try and proceed, you won't be able to do, do that. You'll have to do everything from the start. So once you select I am a H1B registrant, then you should go and uh, if you're doing this on your own, you should say, uh, I want to start a registration. You have to select that part. If you're doing it through an attorney, then the attorney will send you a passcode and you have to select the second option, which has received a passcode from your attorney or representative, right? Right. So that's what you need to select, sorry. Um, once you do that, uh, you will be able to review your G28. You will be able to review um, and accept it. You will be able to review your registration and authorize the registration, sign it, and then you finish and send. And then your attorney will get the message and then they will log into their account and they will submit it. If you're using your attorney. If you're doing it on your own, then you will just select, you know, I want to start a registration and then you have to enter the information required to do a registration. In order to do a registration, you have to have the uh, applicants, the beneficiary's passport information. So uh, their, their first name, middle name, last name, the gender, um, you have to get the, the educational qualifications of the beneficiary. So are you applying under a master's quota or a bachelor's quota, right? So you have to put that information in and then you have to put in the date of birth, the country of birth, uh, country of citizenship. And last but not the least, you have to put in the passport number, right? So uh, make sure when you're putting all this information in that there are no typographical errors. If you make an error and you submit the case, you cannot correct it after that. And if there is an error um, and you're trying to submit your H1B form and it, the information in the form doesn't match with the information in your registration, they could question that. Then you'd have to give additional explanations of you know, why there is a uh, discrepancy and provide additional documentation. So you want to avoid doing that. In addition to the beneficiary information, you'd also have to enter your company information. So you'll need the name of your company, your DBA doing business name, your FEIN number or employer, employer identification number and your address. Again, enter everything correctly. Otherwise, again, you'll have to provide documentation showing that you made a typographical error. Um, so make sure you enter your, your, your address, US address correctly. Um, then uh, once you have logged in, I just wanted to also mention the do's and don'ts, few of them. Um, if you already have an account from last year, please cross check that account before March 1st to see if it's working. Uh, make sure you remember your password and do all that homework before the registration actually starts. Um, so also make what sure if you, you just forget the password, Mr. Ready. Could be like create an there is, there is a, you have those secret questions where you can, you know, you can do forget password and then put in the question and the answer, and then it'll generate a new password, or you can, you know, you can select new password then. Um also um make sure you create an account for yourself 
and go through all these steps before the attorney starts the registration process for you. If you do it after, then uh, they will start the registration, but both of them won't match. Uh, so it won't work. Then the attorney will have to do the registration all over again. So right. first you have to enter, start, enter your account, give, enter the email address, give that same email that you entered into the account to your uh, attorney. So that's how the, both the systems then uh, talk to each other. Yours, your account and your attorney's account. Right. Um, so that's important. As I said, enter H1B registrant, not H1B petitioner. Um, if, if the person doesn't have a last name or first name, uh, sometimes, you know, we enter FNU, LNU, unknown, no name given. Don't enter any, any of those things. Uh, just select um, the drop down in, in the actual application form. Um, also, Sometimes if it doesn't work, just clear the cookies, right? Uh, do a reset, uh, things that usually happen with systems. Uh, so that's about it for you know a quick overview of what to do, not to do, and how to register. Uh, right, you, so you regarding this, we do have some uh, FAQs ready, Miss Ready, because okay. you know uh, this is only the process, but there are some questions that our consumers have asked. So uh, can we go ahead with them, Mr. Adi? Sure, please. Go ahead. Right. So the first one is, is there an appeal process for registrations determined to be invalid dupl duplicates? Unfortunately, no. If uh, there is... Uh, so invalid duplicates is basically what happens is that you might have two employees with the same name uh, or very similar name and the system will... And if you don't enter the passport number, because you don't have to enter the passport number, so if you don't right. choose not to, then they, the system cannot figure out that it's two different people and the second registration will be denied. And there's no appeal process. So that's so important to enter the passport number. Right. And moving on to the next one, if you if you register for the master's cap based on the expectation that the beneficiary will earn a qualifying advanced degree and you're actually selected under the master's cap, but the beneficiary does not obtain their qualifying advanced degree. Is there a risk that the cap subject H1B cap petition for that beneficiary will be denied? Yes, because um, so you can enter uh, a registration based on master's cap, even though the person has not yet received their master's degree, because you're expecting that by the time you file the H1B petition, the master's, they would have received the degree. Uh, so you have to meet those, those expectations at the time of filing the H-1B petition and not at the time of registration. So this is possible, but at least at the time of filing the H-1B, if they still have not received their actual degree, but say they have completed all their requirements towards the coursework and you're able to get a letter from the school saying that all the requirements are completed and maybe the convocation is not done yet or they didn't get the degree because they didn't pay the fee, whatever it might be. Uh, you can still register under master's cap. You can still file the H-1B under master's cap. But, but if they have not finished their master's by then, for whatever reason, then of course you cannot then proceed with your um, H-1B case, filing of your H-1B case. You're out of luck. Right. Right. So um, also, Mr. Adi, the next question is, how will USCIS address the scenario where the prospective employer with a selected registration puts an address on their registration, but moves before they file their I-129 petition such that the addresses on the registration and form I-129 don't match. So this is possible. You can do it. Uh, you can move even after you file the registration. But as I said, you have to give additional explanation to show that you're the same company. You're not some other company with the same name because they're going to see that it's two different addresses and they're going to suspect that maybe you're a different company. Uh, so you have to show a lease, the old lease, the new lease, the proof of address, uh, all this has to be shown. If you're able to show and prove that you're the same company, then absolutely you can file. It just requires right. more paperwork and some explanation. Right. And just, Mr. Adi, if there's a typo on the registration in the comparison to the I-129, will you say it's reject the registration? They won't reject it, but again, explanation will be needed. For example, if you mistyped the name or maybe you've missed the order of the name uh, you have to submit the passport maybe some other documentation showing their name 
just to show that that is the registrant that you find for. You're not trying to bring someone else in uh, and pass them off as that person. So, you know, again, the onus uh, is on you to show that uh, it's the same person. Right. Right. And will will both the attorney and the client need to create a USCIS online account for the H1 via electronic registration process, Ms. Reddy? Yes. So as I said, you have to first create your account and then give your email information to your attorney. And only yes. then the attorney should start the registration process. So it's important that both of you have to have an account because you should be able to cross-check and approve the registration that was done by the attorney by logging right. into your account. Right. So uh, will the system allow for multiple members of the staff to log in uh, into my account at the same time? I mean, if uh, yeah, unfortunately log in at the same time, but um, you can have two different accounts for the same company uh, as long as you use two different email addresses. Uh, but be careful because uh, if you're having two different accounts, you may not be able to figure out if there are any duplicates, and you might try to register or unknowingly one person two times because you have two different accounts and you're not able to keep track, in which case then, as I said, both the registrations will get denied. Right. Noted, Ms. Reddy. Also, uh, how should a registrant with a selected registration notify USCIS if they do not intend to file a petition? So, unfortunately, there is no process. If you don't file the petition once you register and you get approved, um, USCIS when they first started registration said that you know there has to be a compelling reason for not filing the h one because then you're wasting a registration right and this you know we only have it's capped so there's only eighty thousand uh, cases available and you're wasting one of those numbers if you don't file um, but they have not given a mechanism to explain or inform uh, if you don't intend to file and neither have they have there been any repercussions or not filing? So let's see what happens this time, this year. Right. Right. Uh, fingers crossed. So, Ms. Reddy, if a registration is selected and the petition is filed during the 90 day period, but it is rejected, will a petitioner be eligible to refile if they're still within the 90 day window? Yeah, if they're within the 90 day window, uh, they can again refile even if the H1 gets denied. Um, so it might be then useful to file premium processing so that the response comes immediately and you have time to then rectify any issues that came up uh, during the filing of the initial H-1B petition and you're able to refile. So you have a 90-day window, so that's um, basically uh, June 1st. If you're, you're starting April 1st, the filing, then it's June 1st. Right. Right, and, and what happens in the scenario where a person's payment initially clears but subsequently fails? Like, um, you know, maybe the payment is made using an electronic check that is subsequently returned by their bank. If that happens, you're out of luck uh, unless this happens during the registration period because there is, after the registration period closes, usually it's the, the registration period is for like 18 days or 20 days. So after the closing of the registration period, they won't allow you to register even if your registration fails. And that happens. There's one employer that actually filed uh, about 30 registrations and they thought it went through because at that time uh, it went through. And then after the bank uh, did not uh, approve the transactions for whatever reason, a few days later, and of course they filed it in the last moment and all the registrations got denied. Oh, yeah. so, uh, so the so the, the model of the story is file in advance. Don't wait until the last moment. And also inform your bank that, you know, these transactions are taking place so that they don't by mistake, uh, you know, deny the transactions. And make sure you have enough money in the bank, of course. Right. Right. And so uh, with that, Mr. Eddie, we come to the end of the show and we will have to continue this into our next episode for the next week. So um, thank you so much for being on our show, Mr. Reddy. It's a privilege to host you. Thanks, Tony. Take care. And uh, also, before we close, uh, we wish you have a very happy 2023, Mr. Thank you. And thank so you. Happy New Year to you, too. Happy New Year to you, too, and everyone at Sakshi Studios. Thank you, Mr. And to our viewers, of course.
<laughs> yeah, viewers, yes. <laughs> so uh, with that, thank you, viewers. Thank you for watching our show. This is Torani and you're watching Sakshi Live. Mm -hmm.